This is Dib Tech Talk, a show where we make sense of all things cybersecurity for the defense industrial base. You walk into a dark room and there are screens everywhere, and the only illumination in the room is coming from those numerous screens. There are dozens of people talking in hushed voices. Suddenly, an alert pops up on a monitor and everyone leaps into action. You're in the middle of a security operations center. And most likely, this is only in a movie. The DoD supply chain uses millions of different types of hardware and software components. Each one is complex, unique, and ripe for exploit. Every piece of equipment on your network, whether it's an IT or an OT environment, contains weaknesses that should be monitored. Monitoring and remediating vulnerabilities requires a dedicated and learning capability known as a Security Operations Center, or SOC for short. If you've ever wondered exactly what a SOC is and what a SOC should do, stay tuned. I've been working in computers for a long time. Um, I started working uh, in computers doing tape backup on Ultrix and VMS systems, and it's kind of something that most people have never heard of those things. (laughs) So um, I have worked at a number of um, private firms, a number of government agencies, um, educational institutions. Currently, um, my focus is on security operations. Uh, Security operations centers are kind of like the the term that a lot of people use for this SOC or SOC or CSOC, Cybersecurity Operations Center, to kind of differentiate that from the physical security versus the cybersecurity. Largely what I do is I um, help organizations to make sense of all of the various things that they could possibly do in cybersecurity. Um, And I focus on operationalizing those tasks. Um, I have a class that I wrote on this. I um, recently released the um, 2020 um, SOC survey. What is a SOC? Like, what do the letters mean? What is what capabilities do you have to have in order for because there's no like FTC guidelines on what defines a SOC and how you can you know point to fraud. So define a SOC and the capabilities that you would say, yes, you have a SOC because you have these capabilities. Yeah. So let me um, again, I've got a couple of different things that I want to talk about with regard to this. And also, I try to be really careful about expressing what I think versus what the industry thinks, because exactly to your point, the um, opinion of what makes and constitutes a security operations center is something where there's no definitive architecture defined for that. I actually, um, about five years ago, wrote a class which was originally for the SANS Institute and now I teach it independently, which my intention for writing that class was literally, I am going to define a reference architecture for what a security operations center is. And then it was kind of almost like, come at me and tell me I'm wrong. You know what I mean? But like somebody needed to say, this is what a security operations center is. And the approach that I took to this was to define it in terms of functions. So let me just list the functions. Steering committee, which is the capability of the SOC to interface with its constituents. I think this is a function. I think it's a requirement of a security operations center. The command center, which is the overall sort of um, layer around the SOC to just handle the request for information and disseminate information and so on. Monitoring, which is what a lot of people actually consider to be a SOC, is just that monitoring function, which is fast and accurate detection of issues to be able to identify that you have a problem. Threat intelligence. I think that threat intelligence is a portion of any SOC, even if this is just you taking feeds that someone else is producing and using that to enrich the information that you have environment in your environment. Incident response as a functional capability. I don't care if it's outsourced. I don't care if it's a third party, but there must be s- such tight integration between the SOC and the incident response that I just considered a necessary function of a SOC. Forensic analysis, which is deep dive analytical capability in an authoritative fashion to be able to say, when asked the question, what happened? Okay, so this sort of stuff is, is um, what is a SOC plus, plus the capability to do analysis of the defensive posture of the systems. I call this self-assessment, and there's a lot of sort of stuff that goes in, in here, 
vulnerability management. This is, uh, this is the idea of con building configurations and baselines and so on. So all of those sorts of things, again, they might not be directly inside of your security operations center, but they're so tightly coupled with a security operations center that um, I just list it as a function because it's a necessary thing. Okay, so um, earlier you said that there's about 10 people in a SOC. So how are those 10 people weighted across those functions? And can some people do multiple functions? Yeah, so also what I said about the 10 people is most SOCs have that. There are SOCs that have a lot, a lot more people. What's the minimum manning threshold for <laughs> a SOC? You know, because... Because people out there sell, saying that they have a sock and then they've got two people or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and actually I have talked to a lot of people who say I'm a security operations center of one. I do, I do one now, but the other thing is, is that I've actually, um, as an example, I've worked with an organization that has security operations where they have a full-time equivalent of one. They have five employees, but they're basically slicing between those, uh, those staff and they've outsourced all of their um all of their operational management they've uh, op um, and by operational management i mean of the SOC systems they've largely outsourced the monitoring they've largely outsourced their incident response they've largely outsourced their you know so it's like they've you know like they've got a person but they're doing this from an outsourced perspective so again this is why i chose to do the functional depiction because if you can show me you can do all these things then it doesn't matter if it's outsourced or not you have the security operations capability so yeah. right so um i'm assuming that most defense contractors can't afford to in-house everything even if they're outsourcing all of that they're still essentially outsourcing all of that so um if they if these people don't have an in-house it company which most of them don't their it is a third party and so they're going to 100 percent outsource a SOC. um is it um is it weird or is it normal for you know outsourced SOC services to in fact really be outsourcing a lot of their functions like is that a red flag or is that okay or is that something you should even ask about if you're considering a vendor yeah if you're considering a managed security service provider as your sock, right? You're actually going to engage them to do all the stuff for you. You really, especially if you're in the US defense industrial base, you must cascade all requirements to that sock for all of your contracts. That is that is a necessity. There's there's no way around that, right? I mean, this is this. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can probably cite where it says that, <laughs> but it's like you can't. You can't relieve yourself of a contractual obligation by giving somebody else the task to do the work for you. Okay, you still have that contractual obligation. I have a great story I'm going to tell you, and you can cut it out if you want to. But it's it's related actually specifically to uh, to contracting. When I was doing work inside of uh, you know DIB, I was um, on a contract to a very large uh, defense contractor. I was on a contract through a company that had three people and in an audit it was actually determined that since all three of us were cleared the vehicle um, was actually the wrong vehicle because there were three cleared staff on the vehicle and so what they said was um, we need to actually split this from a contracting perspective because of the way that they had onboarded that one company initially and then added a couple more people it was like not okay according to an audit so basically it was like hey chris can you just sign a contract with us to do this thing and so like 160 pages of legal documents later me trying to get all the insurance and all this stuff and do all the things and write all the procedures and do all the right i mean like literally shop of one signing that contract is is a tremendously difficult and challenging thing, right? And now, if I were if I were that, and I had to actually have a security operations center in order to do that, I'd be like, mm, I, I can't see that that's actually worth it financially for me. Is there a SOC capability for OT technology? And by OT, I mean like manufacturing equipment that's not your traditional IT. Is that a thing? Oh, that's absolutely a thing. And it, it's really interesting uh, on that on that regard, because there are some questions 
in the industry. There's no certainty, but some people say IT and OT should be converged. Some people say we, we monitor our OT systems in an entirely different way. I actually, and again, like I have a lot of projects that I've worked on and I won't tell you the, the people and the companies and all that stuff, but I, I can sort of anecdotally explain projects. Like I actually did a design review of a security operations center where they were adding a layer of OT capability into their existing IT. And they had a third party company who was doing the design and development on that. And then um, they had me review the strategy that they were advocating. And basically the strategy in this case was, we're going to have the same analysts who are looking at traditional IT security operation monitoring. We're gonna have a totally different technology um, monitoring OT sy systems. Um, and those same analysts are basically going to have um, high priority alerting off of OT systems, and then they'll go and shift and do investigation in the, in the same way. So, and I, I have all sorts of things that I can talk about, like related to that of other scenarios, but this was a recent one that I did. Are, are the same analysts equipped to, to review OT alerts in the same way that they can review IT alerts? Does it require a separate set of skills or is it same, same? It's not the same in my opinion. Um, I think that from a monitoring capability, if I give an analyst an effectively designed use case and I give that analyst the right sort of things in terms of making a decision if there's a problem, I can train them into that capability in in many ways i'm sorry in, in many ways the same it's the same thinking skill set but it's a different technical application so it's like a, you can think in a language um but if i want you to speak a different language i'm gonna have to get you to speak that language <laughs> right so what kind of alerts would we see in an ot environment like i think we can all imagine what exists in an it environment like oh there's somebody trying to get in your firewalls being whatever, but what kind of alerts would you see in an OT environment? Well, a challenge with that would be m many of the OT environments, the data which is being sent over the OT systems is just a bunch of data, right? So what sort of alerts are you going to see? You're not going to necessarily see the same sort of like attack alert. You're going to need to have some sort of capability to do inference from data components um, you could actually say, all right, here's a, here's a volume deviation, here's a volume dip, right? You could do some, some of that sort of stuff. This actually goes into my thinking around use case development. Use case development, um, and I'm gonna, I don't have it, you know, like memorized exactly, but let me just give you the sort of overarching process that I think is appropriate to go through to develop a use case. And a use case is an engineered strategy. I determine something of, of business relevant right? My business relevance in this case for OT specifically would be, I have monitoring systems which are actually looking at these assets and these assets keep the lights on in the city, right? <laughs> so, so what do we care about? Well, we care about interruptions operationally in, in this way. Then what we do is we look at scenarios where the attacker might do something. They might be able to intervene in control systems related to the actual capabilities that are in place. So that's a scenario. Okay, well, let's take that scenario and let's look for the data. What sort of data will we have for that? Well, there might be command and control coming out. There might be modifications and, and so on. And so then what we look for is within that data, what are some differentiation opportunities for the analyst to be able to say like, this is not okay. And even if we can't say certainly with the tools, it could be, hey, analysts, there might be something that's not okay. Let's go ahead and uh, let's let's go ahead and send that along. Right. So, okay. So that point, it's a there's a separation of duties or not separation of duties, but with regard to the CMMC and compliance, um, getting the alert is one thing, right? And then acting on the alert is is the um, incident response or potential incident response. So who is responsible at that point? Once an, once an analyst is like, yes, this is a true alert. Yes, we need to figure this out. Um, do those analysts then start doing some of the incident response capabilities or do, does that go somewhere else in a, in a traditional SOC setting? Yeah, let me, let me um, address one, one thing before the monitoring analyst really does incident response or anybody does incident response. One of the things that the monitoring analysts actually do, should do first, is verification, right? So it's like the alert comes in 
the person who is watching for these alerts probably shouldn't simply being like, oh, there was an alert, here you go, right? There should be something that is actually verification that's done by that monitoring analyst, okay? Now, the next thing that you just asked me in terms of the transition to incident response and the traditional socket, <laughs> really hard to answer that because um, there are socks at dramatically different scale. Most socks, in terms of the numbers and, and the sock survey and other places, most socks are around 10 people, roughly. So if I have a sock of about 10 people, probably what's going to happen is the, the person who's doing this sort of monitoring capability is going to actually do what I call phase shift. They're going to shift roles from monitoring, hey, let's look to see if there's a problem, to response. This is a standard strategy that a lot of organizations um, employ for incident response, which is phase shift using the same staff. Um, larger organizations okay, um, tend to separate monitoring capability or function from incident response capability and function. Additionally, many organizations elect to actually transfer monitoring to a third party in order to have a cost effective 24 hour a day monitoring. So necessarily then that's a separation of organization in terms of monitoring from response because what in that scenario, um, specifically outsourcing that initial detection, what's happening is you have a transfer of information to a third party. That third party transfers that information to the organization. The organization then does the incident response, or maybe even the organization then turns to a different third party and says, hey, do this response. Now, um, again, I you know, we're, we're talking largely around defense industrial base, uh, this sort of organized and structured chaos, if you will, of, of stuff. Uh, also, having worked inside of U.S. Department of Defense um, in a number of different contractor roles, um, what I often see with that is you have command direction, which then cascades to a contract uh, officer or, or whomever is responsible for receiving that, and then they actually are responsible for doing the response on their systems. You know, so this is this is frequently multiple layers of redirection of of information, and this actually causes a huge problem for a lot of people. If you don't have skilled and capable people across all these different groups, stuff's going to fall apart when you then try to do some coordinated action. So because you do cyber work for DOD, I'm sure you have certifications, you probably have many. Um, so are there certifications out there that if you were to try to in-house a SOC, what certifications would you recommend that your people have um, in order yeah. to understand some of these functions? Yeah, so um, I would go back to the, what is it, the 8570 d documentation on- I used to work in that office. Yeah, 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 that yeah exactly. Yeah, so 8570. So everything that I've ever done for DOD, I was like, you already have all these things actually specified. <laughs> like, like, you know, when I've written stuff on contracts for DOD, I was like, you already have policy which defines this. And for all the customers that I always work on, it's always like, what does the mandate say for you legally in the location that you're working for the details of this? So for the specific um, certifications, there are several through SANS Institute, you know, the, the 504 uh, GCIH, GX Certified Incident Handler. Um, the CISSP um, is one that's, a, that's a, you know, sort of like a, a standard one that's from ISC squared. Um, they, they have that. Um, there, there's a lot of training that I think is valuable, but in terms of certifications for people to be able to have the capability to actually do the monitoring work or to do the forensic work or to do the response work. Um, I would have to go look at 8570 to say like, this is exactly the one that I, that I would say. I have, I have a ton of opinions about training, um, but when you're asking me about certification, <laughs> that's a, you know, it's like a little bit of a different thing. I actually, um, I, I have a, a very, you know, like a very different talk that I gave for Educause where I talk about training specifically, which like, the thing that I'll say about Security Operations Center as a generalization, and this is not specific to DOD, but as a generalization, is the best training that you can do is the lightweight, ongoing, 
self-developed training for your staff for the things that they encounter frequently. And this is something that every SOC that I ever work with, I tell them, you must become a learning SOC. You must, even if you never really truly get there, you must strive to be a learning SOC. Because if what your strategy is, put the bits in the bucket and somebody pits, puts the bits over to somebody else, like that's not really going to help us. You may be able to have compliance sort of a de minimis kind of compliance. But if anybody really challenges you on this, then you're going to actually fall out and actually appear to be a problem. And I'll, I'll give you one other just sort of anecdote around this. Um, I was at Department of Energy. I worked at Department of Energy and Office of Science and then the Chief Information Officer for, um, for uh, US Department of Energy. Um, and I actually went through the Trusted Internet Connection audit um, for the basically for the trusted internet connection. You may not be familiar with uh, what this terminology is, but this is non-DOD, but across all US government. And this was roughly 10 years ago, where basically the US government said, if you were, go if you were a government agency and you were going to be connecting to the internet directly, you must meet this criteria to be able to actually have an internet connection. And so TIC, Trusted Internet Connection, was their, um, their strategy for being able to actually deploy some baseline level of capability. And so I went through the, the tick audit. Um, and at the, at the time, my, my job title was Incident Response Manager for the Office of the Chief Information Officer for DOE, right? Big nationwide network, lots of computers that we owned, lots of computers that were government owned, but we didn't manage. And then in addition to that, lots and lots of computers from contractors who are on our network Right. And so this was again, this was like 10 years ago, trying to uh, trying to wrangle this monster. And, and for everybody who's a, a contractor and, and you're you're upset with the requirements and, and so on, really think about it from the other side for a moment where it's like if you are a large organization and you are entrusting your data to third parties, you need something. You need something that says that you all are trustworthy. And, and again, like this, you know, I think about my computer systems, I put a tremendous amount of effort into protecting my computer systems. But when it gets to somebody else's computer systems, unless I'm under contract with them to do that work, I'm not doing it. So if I'm running a company, then I know that the computer systems are gonna be protected. But if somebody's running a company and they don't have the, the decades of training that I have in what makes good cybersecurity, I'm going to go ahead and guess that they're going to make some mistakes. So there's a so here's my here's my question. So I was talking with someone last night and we were talking about this issue facing the dib, right? Like these companies, a lot of them, a lot of these small businesses, they don't even have the in-house capability to understand what a self what the self-assessment for the NIST 800171 survey is, like how to do a self-assessment in the first place, let alone make sure they have good cybersecurity. So how how does DOD or the federal government help the supply chain besides forcing down requirements that they don't even understand and can't implement. So you said something about um, when you were at DOE, you had a bunch of contractor computers who are on your network that you don't manage. So speaking totally hypothetically as, you know, if you could, if you ruled the world for one day, would it be feasible or would it make any sense for DOD to essentially extend their network to some of these small suppliers and like maybe issue them GFE, government furnished equipment and say, hey, if you're gonna work on our contracts, we don't care which DOD contract, but here you defense contractor, here is some of our network and maybe manage it or not. Like, is that in some way feasible to, to take away some of this massive burden from compliance? So, so I can see a couple of different strategies that might be in place. You could have a common operating environment offering coming out of the department that basically says, hey, contractor, if you just want a laptop, here's what it costs a year for us to manage that laptop. Okay. Like that would be a strategy and contractors wouldn't like it. And the thing would be, you know, like restrictive and all that stuff, but it would make compliance easy. 
Right. So that would be one option. The next option that I could see that could actually be effective, and I suspect that this actually will happen, is you will simply have a private company and whoever it is, let's, let's, I'm going to, I'm going to name a company because it's like an easy thing after I name this company to envision. Let's imagine Amazon says, you want laptops? You can rent laptops from us for a month, a month at a time for this laptop. So you're welcome, Jeff. I know you're on your way out, but here's another money-making idea for you, right? It's like you rent the laptop for the month and that's what you get. And we take care of the compliance. This thing comes through our, um, you know, DOD cloud service, all the hostings there, all done, right? All done. And so this, the reason why I think that this is the one that's going to happen is DOD is, doesn't want to be in the business of um, information system support for their customers. They already have enough challenges and in information system and cybersecurity on their own systems. And I mean, just honestly, it's like, you know, you've seen it, I've seen it. It's a big place, right? There's lots of stuff um, that's, a, that's a real challenge for them to be able to make these things happen. So the, uh, the information technology firm, which solves that problem because people can't do it on their own, is the cloud provider which is end-to-end -end control, management, visibility, monitoring, all these things. This is why, this is why for security operations across every sector, doesn't, in what I'm seeing, everybody's outsourcing a lot of stuff because it's so terribly complicated to do. And so you, you ask the question, like, what does it take to have this in-house? Instead of me talking about functions and people and all this other stuff, I'm going to cite someone else's report because um, I have a bunch of stuff that I've collected, but I also like citing other people's work. Um, Expel, which is a managed security service provider, they actually have um, a, a cost and they, they explain it. It's not fully documented, but it's a pretty good one. If you want to run a 24 by 7 SOC and they have sort of like the minimum, what a 24 by 7 SOC, I think that their report said 1.4 million a, a year. Um, 1.4 million a year for 24 by 7 for the staffing, for the technology, and for the capabilities. And then they said, if you want that to be a learning sock, right? If you, beyond just like baseline, you're doing a thing, if you want it to be a learning sock, I think their number was 6.2 million a year because of all the additional staffing that you actually put into place in order to develop that capability, right? So again, they're a managed, service provi managed security service provider. Maybe they're just scaring people I don't think that they're just scaring people because in the report that they wrote, they have some realistic numbers, right? So that's your range, a million to uh, to six million. In the SOC survey, the 2020 SOC survey that I published at the end of last year, um, I actually have a whole huge section on funding around what this looks like. And the funding range that I'm seeing with people saying, yes, I'm a SOC, is basically like $50,000 to 10 million. Like that's literally the range of people responding actually the the to be precise the top end of the range was four to eight million it was like are you in the four to eight million range and there are people saying we're in the four to eight million a year range uh, for that which actually is somewhat consistent with that expel number of like it takes about six million a year so there's you know it's it's hard to get people to to share that information from a you know, some guy asking people to fill out a SOC survey, even if I do have like, you know, true industry credentials to, uh, to ask that question. So like actually answering that is hard, but it's pretty obvious to me with most small companies that I talk to, there's no way they can do it. There's no way. They so can do, do small businesses like, you know, the, what comprise most of the dib, do they need a SOC? Right. Like now everyone's like, oh, my God, compliance. Ah, and all these soft companies are like, come to us, come to us. Like, do they need one? Like, at what point should a company say we should really invest in in a sock? Either out, probably outsourcing it. Right. But yeah, at what probably point outsourcing. we should outsource this. I, tr I truly think that everybody needs that sort of capability to some degree. Good. Because um, the necessity of monitoring information assets has been proven over and over again. Okay. And I'm not much of a person for, um, you know, for fear mongering, right? I mean, I know that it's a socially useful thing in some cases to scare people into action. But I will tell you 
that information systems, the way that we choose to build them and deploy them currently, they're all vulnerable. And they're all vulnerable in ways that we don't fully understand yet. There are entities in the world who are taking advantage of that vulnerability. And that, that um, actually, my favorite way of talking about these uh, is, is derived from a Defense Science Board report, where the Defense Science Board defined the threats in the environment, and they basically came up with a very simple characterization of it. The $10 club, the million dollar club, and the billion dollar club. Right. And so the billion dollar club um, is an existential threat to an organization and is able to leverage the full spectrum of capabilities. And this is very like defense language around like what could happen. But literally, it's like everything that is possible that could be done. That's what the billion dollar club has at their disposal to accomplish cybersecurity objectives. OK, so if you're in the defense industrial base, guess what? That's in your threat model. So, so it's like you are a stepping stone, you know, you, all these small companies, you're just a stepping stone. Sorry, you're not that important, but you are a stepping stone to a very important organization. And that very important organization understands the way that that adversary is going to get in. How are they going to get in your computer? That's the first step for them. This is very analogous, analogous, uh, anal uh, analogous, similar, analogous. analogous, very analogous to the way that spies operated during the Cold War. Did you ever watch the TV show The Americans? Mm -mm. So it's on FX. Now it's on either Hulu or Netflix. I don't watch a lot of TV. I actually oh haven't watched a lot so, of TV in 20 years. So. Well, if you ever decide to turn on a TV show, I recommend The Americans. I started watching it when I was working on my first master's degree in strategic intelligence. And um, every episode played into like what I was learning at school. Um, but apparently retired CIA operatives were consulting for the show. But it, it shows um, it's based on true stories about Russian spies sent to the United States as like young adults who grew, grow up in America, get married, have American kids. Their kids go to American schools, have no idea, but they are Russian spies and they systematically target very small defense manufacturers and very small paint stores and very small this and that to collect all of the information they need to go after a large target, you know, to steal a nuclear sub, right? To like steal the drawings, but they've targeted. So it's it's a great way to um, visualize like how cyber actors act now. This is not new. The TTPs are not new. It's just a new exactly. vector of attack, right? It's, it's um, a full spectrum of capability. And so like, if you wanna put it in a movie context, Every single movie that you've ever seen is probably somebody who used to work at the DOD who had a clever idea <laughs> that like they're like this couldn't possibly have happened. Right. And, and so, again, just like an, an anecdotal story on a contract that I wrote, uh, sorry, on a contract that I wrote on a document that I wrote for a contract within DOD, I developed a tabletop exercise. This was a decade ago. Right. And the, the thing that I chose, which I thought was most relevant, supply chain attack. Supply chain attack, right? We, and we've seen it before, and we just saw it, you know, like a, a couple you know, weeks ago now with solar winds. And, and it's like this thing, every single information system that we're using, every camera, every microphone, every computer, every single one of them is potentially vulnerable. Okay? Like I get all sorts of new gear. Where does my gear get shipped from? Well, wherever the manufacturer is. Like this is my cell phone. This is my laptop. This, this is the network interface card for every single thing that I actually have on my network. Do I know where all of that outbound communication is actually working? And again, like I'm not trying to scare people. This is the full spectrum. This is real. Like this is not a, a speculated thing. We have seen tangible examples of these specific instances. Do you recall a f just a few years ago? It was um, there was an article, and um, the picture on the article showed a pencil, and it had a, a chip that was smaller than the tip of a pencil, and it was a physical compromise of a piece of hardware that was found in government computers 
Amazon computers, Google computers, Amazon and Google denied it. Everybody denied that they were compromised, but it was a physical compromise of a device, which is like finding a unicorn because physical compromises rarely happen because it requires physical access to a device. Um, but these, uh, I, can't, I can't remember what type of device it was, but they were manufactured by an American company in America, but they were owned by Chinese, like first generation or second generation Chinese uh, nationals who were shipping it all from China. And they were able to place on a device made in China on devices destined downstream for our intelligence community um, and major manufacturers that would end up in Lord knows where. Yeah. Like that's- I actually remember this one specifically. So if I recall correctly, um, it was originally a Bloomberg news article, and there was actually a lot of challenge to the factual integrity of of that particular detection. Uh, yeah, and so there was there were a lot of people who said, you know, you all reported this, you actually don't have the substantiation for that. So, so again, like I don't disagree with it as a potential scenario. I think that that one specific case, they actually. Um, walked it back eventually and they're like, well, maybe this is a little bit of an overstatement in terms of that particular intrusion on the chip, right? And yeah, it's, it, is, it is interesting. That could happen. I think that that particular report, um, there was enough challenge from the industry that they were kind of like, well, yeah, because there's a ton of liability now that they have this, you know, compromised piece of hardware and potentially thousands of computers now. So, you know, yeah who but who like we don't know if that's this true or not the, like the analysis thing so this this goes into the capability of security operations i talked about forensic analysis right one of the sub functions for forensic analysis which i identify is reverse engineering reverse engineering and sort of my you know cascade of capability includes hardware-based reverse engineering and there's a bunch of interesting stuff that's been done and divulged publicly. And just as an example, if you want to if you want to talk about this, a very public example was a couple of years ago at Black Hat, there was a, a, a group which did a discussion of the secure enclave processor on iPhones. And what they did was actually some physical reverse engineering in order to be able to get to the um, ability to do logical reverse engineering of the uh, of the set the secure enclave processor which is responsible for the cryptographic functions now i can't do that you can't do that you know i you know five nines of people in the world can't do that <laughs> you know, not, not, like nobody in the world can do that except for a very small number of laboratories that exist in the world okay so the challenge around that is really hard. I, and one one other personal anecdote that's really funny. I actually my first job in computers. I was 15 years old and I was running tape backup for a place in Massachusetts. They brought me in in the afternoons to be able to run backups because they had a whole bunch of engi engineers who were um, software engineers who were working on an essentially an open source project for integrated circuit design. And this, this integrated circuit design software was something that they actually provided to the universities throughout Massachusetts. And interestingly, at this place, very, you know, near where I grew up, they actually had a, uh, a photolithography facility where they could develop, the, excuse me, the students could develop an integrated circuit chip, and then they would build a one-off integrated circuit chip so that the student designs could actually be tested. Is this MIT? <laughs> um, so MIT was one of the uh, one of the organizations who actually was supported by this. I was uh, I was kind of uh, kind of west of there out near Worcester. Um, and so this was something where um, this was actually funded by the state of Massachusetts and all of the uh, all of the um, universities in Massachusetts who had hardware engineering um, programs would basically, um, you know, like use this project because it was such a cost effective uh, project at that at that time because nobody had that capability, right? It just simply didn't exist. The idea of like how do you build a one off test chip, and my point of even bringing it up is the people who know what this circuitry on the chip does like there's nobody that knows that <laughs> like, 
Can I do a design assessment of an integrated circuit chip to see if there's a back door in it somewhere? Like, I can't do that. Most hardware engineers who could build a chip can't actually do the reversing to be able to see what it's. Right. Well, and and kind of like um, the solar winds thing, right? Did you also read, and maybe you're going to debunk this too, but I read last week in a Wall Street Journal article that 30% of the victims of the solar wind attack were not in fact solar winds customers, which means that malware ended up in their systems, not through solar winds, mm, but through other attack vectors. Yeah. So, so we have to not call it the solar winds attack because it's actually the um sure it's yeah, a malware, not, pervasive not yeah pervasive injection and so that is a very specific sample set this was and this is another thing in security operations is you discover something most of the time that you discover something you didn't discover it yourself actually somebody else gave, gave you the threat intelligence in order to look for it and this is how these victims are being found but so the, within in the solar winds thing, right? Like it came through a patch, like a routine maintenance fix. And so you know the CMMC and NIST 800 say you know uh, assess the risk to your organization before you install new software. Uh, so even if they had somebody on staff who was like, oh, we got this new patch from Solar Winds, let's make sure let's you know run it through our system and make sure it doesn't have malware because it was essentially a zero day exploit like no one knew about it no one nothing was going to be pinged as malware right in well, in this let me let right? me address that let me address that okay N nobody except for fire i found it right okay but there was a tangible artifact with a substantial change from one version to another which could have been identified through assessment now it, it was i mean having a, a major delta right between that that one and this one but that's not necessarily malware right it's or not necessarily malware but there was if if i am if i'm a careful um deployer of software right now personally i don't i don't do this uh i trust my vendor partners and this is what everybody this is what everybody does they trust their vendor partners they trust microsoft they trust you know google for for updates they trust solar runs well solar runs is a stable company right i mean but so if i am an organization if i'm one organization who's actually afraid for some reason and i actually say you know what going forward what we're going to do is every new piece of software that comes in as an update we're going to deploy it to a test system we're going to do a patch diff which patch diffing is a standard um you know reverse engineering type uh type action with software we're going to do a patch diff and we're going to see what changed and if all of a sudden one day someone if someone was literally watching that for every iteration of software that came in, that one thing would have been a weird change, weird enough that someone could have noticed it. Okay, because it's it's not like the chain, it's not like the implant inside of the SolarWinds software was subtle. It was that the implant's behavior was subtle after it got there, and it was part of a legitimate transfer through a supply chain, which was trusted by almost everybody and you know FireEye and their monitoring capability they didn't detect the change until after they saw something weird on their network which then led them down the trail of going and looking of like what is this why is this here and then they did all of the forensic analysis work to be able to understand what it was and then they you know i'm sure that they hypothesized first before they went to solar winds it's like this thing got compromised and they probably couldn't track something which was realistic for that they have like the compromise and they're like gosh like how long has this been here how many versions of solar winds do we have can we go back that takes tons of time tons of resources tons of analysis and knowing that you should continue to pursue that down that down that um sort of pathway of items of interest most people don't have the time patience or resources to do that right so the um the behavior patterns and indicators of the compromise of the solar winds uh, compromise. If people don't know if they're if, if they were compromised or not, because you know if thirty percent of victims aren't even solar wind uh, customers, mm -hmm. would a SOC be able to detect the subtle um, behavior of a compromised system? Like, do we know what they look like? What those um, 
signatures are? Yeah, so now, right now, with ingestion of new threat intelligence, which has been provided by a third party, which is trustworthy, yeah, you could go, you could go find it because it's like, look for these things. The problem with indicator-based detection is if that adversary or somebody who stole the tools of that adversary and modified them, right? Um, if that adversary modified slightly their TTPs, then it's harder for you to see that. Now, the other part of this and the way that I wanna answer this is, could an organization detect it? Absolutely. You know how? Good, effective, long-term security operations with a mind to developing use cases and hunting in the data for things which are anomalies. So how long would it take, uh, hypothetically, to find something in your network like this? Do we know? How no, long, no. Like, at least for the solar winds, you know, it takes like a solid week, like of, you know, checking your data, or is it like a month long thing or a quarter long thing or? Yeah, so um, let me let me address that in a couple of different ways, because it's a really hard question to speculate generally what this would look like. If you already have procedures for historical analysis for network traffic in your environment, and you have PCAP data, or you have, um, you know, um, IP fix type data, of, uh, collections of network flows that you can go back to. Even if you had DNS data that was logged of like, here are all the DNS queries that were made in my environment for an extended period of time. Even if you just had that, that could provide some capability for historical or retroactive analysis using updated indicators. Okay, so that that is something that um, I, I hesitate to say this because people are going to take it the wrong way. But even if you're not looking at the logs, at least log stuff, right? Um, and then if you're saying, okay, I have these requirements, logging is the first step, looking at the logs is the next step, and you have to take the next step. So Chris Crowley did not say that you had logging enough. I said, just start with that. And the next step of what you must do is to also look at the logs. But this is a way with real, with real threat information, you can do historical analysis. And if, and if I have a team who's already accustomed to that and I'm just feeding them new indicators every single day, they could be done in an hour. If I have a team who like is trying to build the capability of doing historical analysis, it might th take them weeks. And this is again, like, why are you operate? Why are you operationalizing this stuff? Security operations is about a lot of these things are routine for us and we can adapt to whatever circumstances come up. And we have, we have some of that capability in place.